2 Kings chapter 22. Taking a break from our series through the Gospel of John this week in preparation for revival meetings. 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. And if you're using a pew Bible, like mine, well, mine's not a pew Bible, but it's the same. It's on page number 552 toward the front of your Bible. And uh, different cover, same pages. <laughs> and that's 2 Kings chapter 22. And we'll start reading at verse 8. 2 Kings 22 and verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest that delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah the servant of the king's, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that is written, that which is written concerning us. And, and they get into a bit more detail as you go through the end of the chapter. And then it goes in chapter 23, describes what the king did in response to the reading of this book. It was the book of the law and how he realized our, the way we're living right now is not according to God's word. And, uh, and he leads the nation of Judah in a national revival. Uh, and so really it was initially, it was Josiah who experienced revival in his own heart because of what he, uh, experienced, what he saw there in the law, and that led to a national revival as, as his, in, his, in his position as being an influential leader uh, that ended up spreading uh, throughout the nation of Judah. So the message this morning is, what is revival? What is revival? Or we could also entitle it, Getting Ready for Revival. Getting Ready for Revival. And that's what this whole purpose is today, both this morning and tonight, uh, being just, just a, a warm-up or, or a, an introduction to why, would we have, why, why do we have revival meetings in the first place? What is revival? Uh, why is it important? And that's what we're, the message is this morning. What is revival? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for this great account we have, this, this godly king who wanted to do what was right and he had a great influence uh, on his uh, nation, on the people there uh, because of what he saw in your word. And so Lord, I pray that you would also help us to have hearts that are open to your leading, open to your word. And when we see things that don't line up with the word, that we would have as much zeal and passion and desire as, as uh, Josiah did to uh, be right with you. And, uh, and who knows, uh, you know what uh, impact that can make in the lives of the people around us. And if there is enough people who, uh, and many Christ enough Christians who experience revival, uh, it could have a profound impact on our country. On our, and if we have a na national revival or a, an area, regional revival, but whatever it is, Lord, most of all, it starts with revival in our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that we would uh, see these things here clearly from your word today and take heed to them in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What is revival? What is revival? Well, the word revival, which root word is revive, uh, it means a few different things. Um, one is to return, to recall, or recovery uh, to life from death or apparent death as the revival of a drowned person. Second definition, revival means return or recall to activity from a state of languor as the revival of spirits. Third definition, recall, return, or recovery from a state of neglect, oblivion, obscurity, or depression as the revival of letters or learning. So notice the pattern here. Those are three secular definitions of revival, uh, but it, they all mean the same thing, return, recall, or recovery. 
And then the fourth definition is, is more of a, a, in the religious or spiritual aspect, renewed and more active attention to religion and awakening of men to their spiritual concerns. And so there are times when things can be let, uh, uh, can slip after a while, in other words. So it's basically, we live in a, just a secular world, we live in an ungodly world, and so we can get used to going through the motions in this world, and we can just, there are certain things that then can just slip in our own lives, in our own hearts. Uh, that, and this is, by the way, this is really directed to Christians. This is directed to those who do know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, uh, because a a person who does not know Christ, if they've if they don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, there's never been a point in time where you've recognized your sinful condition before God and that you need a Savior and you trusted in Christ alone to be your Savior based on His death, His burial, and resurrection. Uh, then you have nothing to revive because you have nothing. You don't. You're not spiritually alive. Uh, you're still dead in your trespasses and sins. And so what you need first is a born-again experience, trusting Christ as your Savior. But for those who have been born again, those who are spiritually quickened in Christ Jesus by the Holy Ghost, there are times when we don't, we don't necessarily, our spirit doesn't die, so to speak, but, uh, but at the same time, just in our own hearts and our lives and our Christian life, there are things that can slip. We kind of get into a, 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 a rut maybe. Uh, we don't have as much of a vibrant life of living for the Lord, a vibrant walk with the Lord. And that's what uh, revival, but really a lot of the purpose of revival meetings is to really give that, like I said earlier, a shot in the arm to, uh, to, to reminding us and awakening uh, as we fix our attention on that. Because there's so many things in the world that uh, often demand our attention. Not everything is deserving of our attention. Uh, but at the same time, we have many cares of this world, many things in our minds and our hearts, and we go through life and I don't know if, if, if you're like me, but I, my, I just feel like the, uh, it just sure, sure seems to me that the weeks just fly on by. And uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe for you they drag. I'm not sure. But for me, they just, seem to, they just seem to fly by. And I think, wow, where does the time go? And, uh, and there are times when the days are just flying by, the weeks are flying by, and you're, you're just zeroed in on the daily tasks of what you normally do. Um, you know, then we, we need a time where we really focus on the things of the Lord and have that extra special time of, of revival and, uh, and, and seeking, uh, seeking the Lord. And preaching is, is really at the heart of that, the preaching of God's Word, and that's what we'll see here with King Josiah and the nation of Judah. King Josiah experienced a personal revival, which then led to the national revival, and it was all based on him seeing the words of the law, him seeing God's Word. That was what started it. They found a book, and apparently it had been neglected. These, they're wanting to refurbish the temple. They're wanting to get things back the way they should be, and then they find this book, and Josiah looks at this book saying, what I'm seeing in our nation is not the same thing as what it says in this book. And that is what happens. That is how a nation or individuals or even churches can let things slip is when there's not a, an attention given to the things in the Word of God. And a, and a hunger and a, and a taking in of the Word of God and applying it to our lives. That is a recipe for disaster when it comes to uh, the spiritual life of a person, church, or a nation is the neglect of the Word of God. How did the revival begin? Well, as I, as I said, uh, it was by the rediscovery and reading of a book of God's law. Uh, that was the start of it, and that's why we believe so much in Bible preaching around here, because that's what has the power. The, God's Word is alive. It's not dead like the words on a, on a paper. Yes, you know, there are people who write day to day. There are many books uh, in the world, many newspapers. There's a lot written online. Uh, but at the same time, it is not alive in the same way. A, it's just an ever-living word like the Word of God. As the Bible says, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that word quick means it's alive. It's alive. It's it's not something that, oh, it was written back many, many years ago, and so now it's just kind of a stale book. No, it's just an ongoing, ever-living book that has the, still has the power to change lives. And so they, they discovered the book, and, and, and they read it. It was, it was handed to King Josiah, and he read it, and that's how it began. That's how it began. What did the revival look like? What did the revival look like? Well, first of all, it was a, the revival in the nation of Judah 
was a special gathering of the people to hear the word of God. Look at uh, chapter 23 and verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 1. It says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And so then he goes on and he, he makes a covenant with the people. Actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but basically he, 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 he says, gather everybody together. Let's get everybody together. Let's have an assembly. Call everybody to come and we're going to read God's law. We're going we're to have this read out loud in the ears of all the people. Uh, and it was the, all, it says all the people, both small and great, didn't matter who they were, they all gathered uh, for the preaching, for the reading of God's word. And so it is a special gathering of the people to hear the word of God. And that's what we do. That's why we schedule these meetings. It's a special gathering, an unusual gathering. It's not according to our regular schedule. We add in services uh, and, and it's, it's for people to hear the word of God. Now, some churches do a Sunday through Wednesday revival meeting. Sometimes with the Danfords, they do Sunday through Thursday. Uh, Brother Danford especially likes to do Sunday through Friday. Because, I mean, once you, once you get to Wednesday, I mean, you're, you're not done yet on Wednesday. You're not done yet. It's, it's not as complete as when you go. And by the way, years ago, I mean, there used to be one-week revivals, two-week revivals, three-week revivals. I mean, there was, it was just ongoing. It's, there would be tent meetings, and they would just continue. And, uh, and those things are, are, for the most part, a thing of the past. Uh, because, you know, many times people have busy schedules and short attention spans. And, wow, wow that's a big commitment to make. But you know what is, what's God worth to you? What is being right with God worth to you? What is God's word worth to you? What is the preaching of God's word worth to you? So it consisted of a special gathering of the people to hear the word of God. Uh, the second thing that the revival looked like was it was a declaration to follow the Lord and wholeheartedly obey him. Look at verse 3 in, in 2 Kings 23. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And that's one of the, so that's another thing the revival consists of. And that's one of the things revival meetings consist of. It gives you an opportunity to really make a commitment. By the way, this is in every church service. Every time the Word of God is preached, that's why we have an invitation after the messages. And, and we don't really, I know in a lot of churches, it's, it's customary. It's, you know, people oftentimes will come forward and pray, and, and they, have, they have little altar benches here, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll kneel at those. And, uh, and, 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 so, and, and in our previous uh, setup, before the spacing things out, usually the front row was open quite a bit. And when we had more rows here, uh, it was open quite a bit, and people could come to the front and at least kneel at the chairs and pray. And it's a stepping out because it, the stepping out is significant because it's a, it's a, you're just, it's showing your seriousness and your commitment. You're showing the Lord, I'm serious about doing business with you, stepping out. And by the way, some people would say, well, you can just do that at your seat. Well, you can do that at your seat. But I will say that it's, it's how, how committed are you to responding to what God's Word says, responding to the preaching of God's Word. And I know with Brother Danford, what he will do, and, and he did this last year, and we, like I said, because of our setup here and just, just the way we normally do things, it, it, it's a little different. Uh, it'll look a little different when he's here because I'm sure he will be, he will give you that invitation. Just get out of your seat. You can come to the front. You can pray. And, uh, and that is simply just make a declaration, make a commitment to the Lord. Just come to the front and pray, or you can stay in your seat to pray. We might have to do more staying in the seat or not. Sometimes people just come to the front and they can pray. And not, you don't have to lean against anything. You can just come to the front, lean against the wall. <laughs> but either way, that's an opportunity you have during these meetings is after every message, particularly uh, every uh, of the preaching message, not sh necessarily sure about Sunday school, but the preaching messages during the worship services uh, to have an invitation to whether you're in your seat, whether you want to come forward, to make that commitment. Whatever God is working on in your heart, just commit yourself 
to following him and, and just getting a hold of God during this week of meetings. And uh, you'll have that opportunity. And the people made a declaration. He, he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord. That's the significance of an invitation time after the messages is, is talk to God. Talk to God about whatever He has spoken to your heart about during the message. Sometimes there might be people who need to be saved. Maybe someone does not know Christ as their Savior and you come under conviction. You need to talk to somebody. That invitation time is also a time to talk to somebody. Talk to me. Talk to Brother Danford. Talk to my wife. Talk to, uh, uh, you know, there are various, various individuals who can, uh, who can guide you in that as far as uh, leading you to Christ, showing you how you can be saved. That invitation time, that time of commitment is, is, uh, is, is available at that time. And then, of course, talking, is, is, talking to someone is available at any time, by the way, not just after a service or after a preaching message, but, um, but it involves a declaration to follow the Lord and to wholeheartedly obey Him. They wanted to uh, look at verse 3 again. It says, to keep His commandments and His testimonies and His statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Now, human nature means that just because you make that declaration, you make that commitment one time, does not mean you don't have to then later on go back and make it again. <laughs> because like I said, things slip. Things slip. You know, why are we having revival meetings this year? Didn't we have revival meetings last year? Or last August we had them? You know, how many of you thir- who were here 13 months ago, here for the meetings... How many of you think, I, I'm, I'm set, you know, I'm good. I think, uh, I don't think you'd raise your hand if, if you were thinking that anyway, most likely. Um, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, but uh, actually, I w- I'd hope you really wouldn't. Um, but I um, hope you'd keep that to yourself, at least in public. Um, but, you know, I, maybe, maybe phrase it another way. You know, how many of you, if you were here 13 months ago, would say, you know, I had really revival in my heart 13 months ago, but I could really use a nice boost, a good revival in my heart for this coming week. I could, I raise my hand. And um, so, you know, 13 months later, that's well, just, just a year later. Aren't you good? Aren't you, aren't you set from last year? No, I need some more. I need some more. And, uh, and as you see in the, in the history of Judah and the history of the nation of Israel, they needed more too. Because just because Josiah led them in revival, they didn't stay that way. They still faced captivity. They faced the, the chastisement of God because of them, t- once again, later on, turning against his word. And, uh, and that's what we need. We need that, that uh, revitalization, that revival, that renewal uh, on a regular basis. And that's why we schedule these meetings. It's a declaration to follow the Lord and wholeheartedly obey him and also involved... This revival in 2 Kings 23, the revival in Judah, involved purging the land of idols and other forms of wickedness. Let's start reading at verse 4 in 2 Kings chapter 23. It says, And the high priest commanded Hilkiah, I'm sorry, and the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, And for the grove and for all the host of heaven, and he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven." And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it to uh, small to powder and cast the powder thereof under the, upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the groves. In other words, that was a place of worship as well. And he brought out all the priests of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense. And so what we see is some major things happening here. And, of course, Josiah was able to do that because he had the governmental authority. 
uh, as the king, he was able to do that. So I'm not saying, I'm not promoting, you know, when you experience revival, you know, uh, during the revival meetings, we're just going to go all around town and just start ripping places down and ripping places apart. Okay, I'm not uh, advocating for that. But what needs to be ripped down in your own life? What needs to be stamped out in your own life? What needs to be put down in your own life? When, we, when there are enough people in a town or in a state or in a country that start putting these things down, that will change what is around in our communities. That'll change what is around in our, in our states, what is available in our states and across the country. The condition of America and the condition of Massachusetts is based upon the spiritual condition of the people, and often it really starts with the condition of the churches. And uh, when you go to a place where there's so much apostasy and so much compromise in whatever churches that exist, you're not going to find a spiritually vibrant community. You're going to find a community that is steeped in the types of things that we see here. Now, maybe they're not worshiping Baal in the same way. Uh, maybe they don't have the those that are actually the houses of the sodomites in, in the sense of a particular position uh, as far as their religious rituals. Uh, but at the same time, those same sins are still very alive and well and prevalent in our society. And one thing that we do have, we, and we don't, always, we don't have power over all of that. One thing we do have power over is what goes on in our own homes in our own families, our own lives, with our own children. We should have something to do with that. And let me tell you, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of things that Christians take in that they don't realize, you may not realize, are just steeped in paganism, in fornication. By the way, Baal was one of the main gods. But they, they all go back to, no matter what their name was, they all go back to the Babylonian mystery religions. And every time, when you read the accounts of the old pagan religions and back in Bible times, uh, from around the time of the Tower of Babel and even and then beyond there, it always involved fornication. That was always a uh, that was always a, an integral part of the uh, religious practices of the pagans. And uh, they also involved involved child sacrifices. Is paganism. Um, Ashtaroth, they don't mention Ashtaroth here, but one of the, the gods. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in, in verse 10, look down at verse 10, and he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. And so just the horrible things that were done in the name of these religions, these pagan, wicked, occultic religions, and, and so there was the, uh, so Josiah's taking care of that. He's taking care of business. But many of these, um, uh, one of the gods or goddesses that was a stumbling block to the nations of Israel and Judah throughout their history was the goddess Ashtaroth. And that is basically that is goddess worship. And goddess worship also involves a lot of fornication and filthiness. And, uh, and so think about this. How much is America permeated with filth and fornication, just permeated through both what people are doing themselves, through our entertainment, through uh, just, just permeates our society. Now that, even if people aren't worshiping those specific gods, they are still tapping into the same paganism that these people back then were part of. Now, someone might not have an altar to uh, Baal, or, or to Ashtaroth or to Molech. But there's, there's a lot of the same things still going on here. It's just the, the goddesses' names are different. And um, let me just tell you, a lot, of the, a lot of the pop music that is done today, especially by the young female artists, I don't recommend watching their music videos or, just, or even listening to their music, but I especially don't work, recommend watching their music videos. But a lot of that, that is basically paganism, and fornication that's being promoted by these, by the modern entertainment industry. And yet we have a lot of Christians who just go after that stuff and take it in and take it in and they realize they're just taking in paganism. And I, I saw some, 
I saw a post on Facebook of someone who's a professing Christian and they showed a picture of their son and, um, oh, he's listening to Beyonce. I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? Number one, that you're letting them listen to Beyonce and number two, that you're actually advertising on Facebook. Who cares? Well, I, I mean, God cares. I care, but... But yeah, yeah, here's your son. Oh, that's going to be a great influence on him. Yeah, listen to, listen to Beyonce, a filthy singer, uh, just, just immoral, immodest. And that's what people are just soaking in, soaking in, even a lot of Christians. And so even though there's not the same, you'd say, well, we don't see these same high places. We don't see the same. Well, the, the, the modern day high places are the concerts. Modern day high places are the entertainment venues that pump this stuff out. The modern day high places are the streaming services that pump this stuff out. They, um, so they purge the land of idols and other forms of wickedness. Now, let me just say this. Um, there is, I, I can't go into really detail about what this is about. You, you might have heard about this. There's a new, uh, it's either a film or a program. I don't remember if it's a film or program on Netflix uh, that involves... Um, Basically, it's, it's, it's like next thing to pedophilia. I mean, it's just, it's just filthy. You know, I didn't watch any videos of it. I read a description of, of what some people said about what it consists of. And it's just the most disgusting uh, garbage that is being pumped out. And by the way, Netflix is one of the worst. I mean, they're all bad. But Netflix has been one of the worst propagators of, of filth and, and perversion. Um, and Disney's really no better anyway, but in certain ways. But uh, Netflix is on the cutting edge of that. Uh, but there's, it, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't even, I could mention Disney, I could mention, um, you could mention HBO, you could mention, I mean, they're all, they're all just propagators of the filth of, of, uh, that, that plagues our society. But guess what? People keep taking it in for some reason. I don't know if they have nothing better to do or, or what the situation is, but um, they just keep taking it in. But anyway, there's a, uh, a pastor in California, and I don't, I don't necessarily endorse all of his doctrine, but uh, in certain areas I, I appreciate his stand and some of his teaching, but his name's John MacArthur, and he's a, well-known, uh, he's a well-known pastor. Like I said, I don't endorse all of his doctrine. But he was on, um, he was on Fox News because uh, he had a court ruling against him saying that this Sunday they were uh, not able, not going to be allowed to meet. Now, they had, I think, two or three rulings we're in their favor up to this point, but the city kept coming back to them or the county or whoever it is they're fighting against kept coming back against them, trying to keep, keep them from meeting legally. And so finally the judge decided, well, now the, it shifted more in the county or the city's favor. And so they said, we're ruling against that you, you cannot meet. Your church cannot meet. And uh, so they, they were talking about that uh, on, on this interview, but they also asked him about this particular uh, film on, on Netflix. And uh, he had a, I really appreciate his answer. It was an excellent answer. And he basically said, when you, have, when you have a society that has embraced the LGBT agenda and you've had a society that is, has, has rejected God and the Bible, you know, the sliding board is greased, basically, and you're just going to keep on going down. And there's not really a point where you can step in and say, well, that's too far. And he's absolutely right. Was just a little, it's just a little bit farther every time, and once, once that's greased, once you get on that sliding board and it's greased, I mean, you just better, you're just on that ride downhill. And he basically was saying it's not good, thing, not good for America, but what he said, it's a reflection of a nation that has lost its conscience, that has no conscience. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to say it because, and he didn't say this, it just came to my mind afterwards, it's been said that the churches are to be, or the preachers, I don't know if they said, I've said the pulpits, the preachers, or the churches, probably you could fill in the blank with any of those. The churches are America's conscience. The pastors, the preachers are to be America's conscience. Well, what are the conditions of a lot of the churches of America now? They've just accepted the world into their churches, and they have no conscience anymore either. So if a church itself gets to the position where it has no conscience, no way is that pulpit, no way is that preaching going to be able to be the conscience of America. That church is not going to be the conscience of their area. And so that, and, and by the way, that's just widespread. That's not just around here. That is all over America, is that the churches have just 
open wide their doors to the world, to paganism, to wickedness and worldliness. And now, why do you think America has no conscience? Be and we're on that sliding board downhill because the condition of the churches. We can try to blame politicians. We can say, oh, this politician, they're wicked. They're why do they get elected to office? Who elects them to office? Yeah. The people elect them to office. Why? I mean, if, if America had a conscience, you would just, we, people would be stand, standing up and saying no to, this, uh, to, these, to these people. So we tr people try to blame the, the politicians, and they say every year or every four years, this, is, this, this election is going to determine the direction of America. I mean, this is the future of America right here. The future of America hangs in the balance with this election. And they're saying it for this year. They said it four years ago. They said it, I mean, every, every year it just gets more and more. The future of America hangs in the balance. Well, let me just tell you this. I, as the far, best as I can tell, as far as I can tell, no matter who's been in office from no matter what political party, that has not changed the spiritual condition of America. That has not affected who has been in office has not really affected the spiritual condition of America that much. Now, yes, they do have influence. So in some regard, uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes the Christians do need somebody who's opposed to the things of God in office. So they get their eyes off of a politician and get their eyes on the Lord. Because too many times, once we get our man or our woman, whoever might be into office, wow, things are finally straightening out in America. No, they're not straightening out in America. The only way things are going to get straightened out in America is if the churches get straightened out, if the Christians get straightened out. And so, and that's what they, they were, they were straight, trying to straighten some things out here. And... Um, They also, as, as part of the purging the land of idols and other forms of wickedness, we see this happening in the book of Acts. So keep your finger there in uh, 2 Kings, because we'll come back there. But uh, Acts chapter 19 in the New Testament, Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, and uh, start reading at verse 11. Acts chapter 19 and verse 11 says, And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Some of these false... Uh, Teachers, these false prophets, they, um, they were uh, trying to, to show off a bit and casting out this evil spirit, <laughs> and it didn't go so well. Uh, he says, I, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who are ye? Basically, they had no authority. And um, so it didn't, uh, didn't look good for them. And so once people heard about that, once they realized, wow, there's something special, there's something different about Jesus, there's something different about about. Paul preaching Jesus and what Paul has done. Then it says, fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Curious arts. In verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. How was the word of God able to prevail and grow? It was when they got rid of their other junk. They got rid of their other bad books. They got rid of their other bad things that they had. And so that gave more room for the word of God to have to wor move, wor uh, uh, work and move. I'm trying to combine uh, two words, woove, um, woove, murk, um, work and move. 
So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, Albert Barnes, the commentator, says that these curious arts, arts or practices requiring skill, address, and cunning, the word used here denotes properly those things that require care or skill, and was thus applied to the arts of magic, jugglery, and sleight of hand that were practiced so extensively in Eastern countries. That such arts were practiced at Ephesus is well known. The Ephesian letters by which incantations and charms were supposed to be produced were much celebrated. They seem to have consisted of certain combinations of letters or words, which by being pronounced with certain intonations of voice, were believed to be effectual in expelling diseases or evil spirits, or which by being written on parchment and worn, were supposed to operate as amulets or charms to guard from evil spirits or from danger. So these were things getting into the spirit realm that were not of God, uh, a lot of superstition and magic. And so they said, we're, we're bringing this. Now, notice that it said in verse, in verse 19, it says they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. We don't necessarily know exactly what, how, how big the pieces were, you know, what was the value. We just know that's a lot. I mean, there's a reason it's mentioned there. This is a, lot, a very valuable, as far as in the world's eyes, very valuable uh, uh, collection. Now, I, I t- talked to someone um, who, uh, well, a number of years ago, and he was, um, was one that he had gotten saved. And I, I think his dad must, I think his dad was, uh, had been an, uh, a drunkard and had really bad drinking problems. And I think he might have even had drinking problems at certain times, this guy, but then he didn't drink anymore. But yet he kept a display of these expensive, liquors, vodka, what, whatever, these different beverages in his, in his house. He had this display, and it was probably worth quite a bit of money. And he told me, basically, he just couldn't bring himself to getting rid of it. He didn't really think it was a big deal to have that there. It was just, it kind of seemed like it was too valuable. I don't remember the exact words he used, but he wasn't going to get rid of that. Now, what message is that sending to his young children, and young children at the time? What message is that sending them? He might not be getting it out and cracking it open and drinking this. He might not be a drunk in the home and being angry and violent and abusive. But what message is he sending? He's opening doors for his children that they're going to have to deal with later. And it sounds like that kind of ran in the family. And one of the issues, I believe, had to do with its worth. Like, well, you know, I kind of have it now. I kind of spent the money on it. You know what, if it's something you spent money on and you shouldn't have had it, it's already wasted. Whether you keep it or not, it's already wasted if it's not right for you to have. So just go ahead and get rid of it. Um, and that's what they did. It was, they were serious about getting rid of some of this, this, this pagan stuff, this idolatrous stuff, this occultic stuff. Um, and uh, that's what we need Christians to be really serious about today. Now, the devil's slick, though, because um, it used to be that you, you had these things physically. And so you bring your CDs, you bring your DVDs, you bring your books, you bring all this physical stuff. Well, now it doesn't work quite the same way. Now, in, in, a lot of, in some cases, it still might. But, you know, so much has gone online. So how do you, you can't rip the stuff out of the <laughs> your devices and get rid of it? That's when you really got to make some choices. What am I going to even have? What am I, what am I going to allow into my home? What am I doing spiritually? Now, I, I am of like passions as you. As Paul said, you know, I'm a man of like passions. I can say I'm a man of like passions. I'm not standing up here on some superior spiritual plane like, you know, none of this stuff affects me. None of this stuff touches me. I'm, I am subject to the same temptations and things as you are. But I do know this for a fact. Now, maybe the Lord just does this to me. Uh, maybe he doesn't handle it the same way with everybody else. But I know this for myself. And there are times that I've really delved into a bit more of carnality of things that uh, maybe some things that I can maybe try to justify. Well, it's not that bad. I'm just going to watch these programs. I'm going to order this particular service. And I can guarantee, I can tell you every single time I've done that, it has caught, there, has been, there have been issues in our home. Completely, seemingly unrelated, but I know. My wife might not, might not know. My children might not know. But I can tell there is something going on here that God is not blessing, and he's allowing some things to happen, stirring things up in our home. And it's taken different forms in those different times. And I realize, thinking, 
okay, I better deal with that. I know, I know what it is. <laughs> it's not, I'm not being spooky or super, it, I'm just saying I know what it is. And uh, I'm not saying every time you have problems in your home, it's related to that, okay? There may be various reasons to have problems in the home. I'm just telling you about my own situation. I know there's, there are people, they like certain shows. They like certain shows. These are the better shows. And you, 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 you got to deal with that in your own heart with the Lord, what you watch and what you take in. I, I'm not going to dictate every little thing what you should or should not be watching. You, if you're saved, you have, the Holy, you have the same Holy Spirit I do. You have the same Bible I do. And uh, you just need to deal with the Lord and your own conscience, your own convictions about that. But I'm just telling you, there is a lot going on that we don't understand in the spirit realm when it comes to this paganism and this occultism, that the devil is, he's, he's spreading his philosophy and his theology, his doctrine, and he's using the entertainment industry to do it, whether it's through programming, whether it's through uh, music, the music industry. And how many times have we seen, maybe you've not seen, but how many times has it been evident that whether it's at a Super Bowl halftime show or these music videos, there's so much occult imagery in the stuff that goes on. They're not, they don't even, they're not even hiding it as much anymore. It's just right there. But a lot of people just don't think anything of it. And why? Because it is appealing to the flesh. It feels good. That's why, that's why we still struggle with it. Because we still, even with the Holy Spirit in our lives, we still deal with the lust of the flesh. And so we have to decide the way that we win those victory, win the victory over the lust of the flesh on an ongoing basis is that we need to yield ourselves to the Spirit. We need to be filling ourselves with God's Word. We need to walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But then also, the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He said, basically, don't even put the things in front of you that you know you're going to have to battle against. Just, just separate from those things. And there's, some, there's a difference between what you can purposely avoid and what you have no opportunity to avoid. There are certain things in life that we see and that, that happen in, in society around us that we just, we can't avoid. And I believe, you know, God, there is a distinction there. I believe God gives extra grace and help when you're exposed to things that you didn't have a choice in the matter of, and, but, you, but yet He knows your heart, He knows your intentions, and He helps you through that. But there's there's only so much God's going to be able to do for you if you're making the willful choice to put certain things in your life. You put these things in your life and then, then you're struggling with the flesh, you're struggling with temptation. God, help me with this flesh, this temptation, but God, help me with this. And yet you're, you're pro making provision for it. You're providing, you're have, you have a place for it. And God's there wanting to help you. He's wanting to empower you. He's wanting to instill more of your grace or more of His grace in you. But yet, you've got to make the choice. Well, there's some, something I do have a choice in the matter of that I'm going to separate from. And uh, it, it requires, it just requires a change. We can't think like the world in these things. The world just kind of takes it for granted, like we've got to have our entertainment. We've got to have these things. And, and, and it's, but it's been a corrupting force. And by the way, um, now, my wife and I are fortunate because... Um, we have six kids, so we have no shortage of entertainment at home. Um, some of you are not in that position, uh, but uh, maybe you don't have six kids. Maybe you at least have a couple kids or a few kids. You have some entertainment at home, okay? And, um, and there's all kinds of things that, that you can take advantage of when you have children at home. And just, just take, take advantage of that time. And don't, don't waste it on emptiness of the world's things and entertainment. Um, but... Uh, but, you know, there are people who maybe God wants you to minister to. He wants you to witness to. He wants you to reach with His Word. But because you've filled your life up with so much flesh and carnality, you're not really of the right mindset to even minister to people properly. You could be educating yourself more on the things of God's Word and those are the, the things that are people are dealing with. And, and then you could be in that perfect position. But yet... The devil wants our lives, our minds filled up with all kinds of other things. And let me tell you, depending on what I've filled my mind up with throughout the week, and especially on a Saturday, really affects my state of mind going into a Sunday and preaching. 
and I can get up here. I might have my notes ready. I might go through the motions and I might uh, be able to, it might sound good to you, but I know there's a difference. I know I'm a little, I'm off track a bit. And why? Because it's what I've filled my mind with in the days before. So do we want to live an empowered, revived Christian life or not? Well, that was the thing, is is Josiah wanted to. He had a heart to live for God. He had a heart. And that's where it starts. It starts with a desire. It starts with a desire. Proverbs says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. It starts with a desire of the heart. And if you don't have that desire, if you're still trying to make excuses for the flesh, there's only so much God's going to be able to do for you this revival meeting. I mean, he might, he might be laying it right there on a platter. It's there available for you. He wants to work, and he wants to do a great, mighty work in your life and in our church. But it starts with our desire, our yielded spirit to God for him to have his way. The last point, uh, the last part of how the, what the revival looked like back in 2 Kings chapter th- uh, 23 It involved uh, getting back to the basics of living for God with great dedication. Getting back to the basics of living for God with great dedication. Uh, Verses uh, 21 through 23, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. For the Jews, um, it was supposed to be a regular thing, a yearly thing, the Passover. And that had been neglected. The things that God said for them to do in his law had been neglected. And so one of the results of them getting revived was getting back to the basics of living for God. Just doing those things that just are, are very basic not earth shattering. I mean, this was, an, this was a, a really amazing time period, that initial time period of revival. But then, then from there, not, every, not all aspects of the spiritual life or, or our own physical lives in this world are mountaintop experiences. We could say, boom, wow. I, you know, I would regard a, a revival meeting as a mountaintop experience, just taking in that preaching, God's doing a work in your heart. Not all the Christian life is like that in the same extent. But what we do is once we get on that higher ground and get some things right with God, then what do we do to maintain that? And that becomes a challenge. That's how we keep from letting things slip is, how can I maintain this? And that's what they did. They got back to the things, got back to the basics of living for God with great dedication. Do you want revival? Do you want revival? I encourage you, have a, have a dedicated heart. A heart that's seeking the Lord and say, would you just do something in my life? I don't know what you're going to do, but I, I just know you have something for me. Would you please really speak to me through the preaching of your word this coming week, God? Would you please uh, uh, use, that, use the messages, use the music, use whatever it is in these services that it would be a reviving experience for me. And I'm just willing to follow you and serve you and do whatever you want me to do. As if you have that heart going into this week of meetings, then you get to experience more of what biblical revival is. And that's the key, what we need. We don't really need a spiritual revival. There's a lot of spiritism and a lot of people who operate on emotions and operate on uh, just spiritualism. But what we need is a biblical revival. What does the Bible say? What what does the Bible say our lives should look like? You know, some a, a woman told me one time, she says, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. I think if I remember correctly, she's there puffing on a cigarette. Um, I don't know what she meant. I don't know what she meant by saying I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. But my guess is she didn't go to church anywhere. It's like kind of people who say they're spiritual. Oh, I do my own thing. I'm not religious. I just kind of have my own. No, they're they're living for the God of themselves is what they're doing. Trying to come to God on their own terms is really what it is. And uh, it's not a spiritual revival we need because there's, you know, occultism is spiritualism. You know, paganism is spiritual. <laughs> what we need is a biblical revival, a Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit revival in our own hearts, in our church, and then in our community. And I'd love to see revival in Massachusetts. I'd love to see revival in Greenfield. I'd love to see revival across America. But there's a lot of counterfeit. There's a lot of emotionalism out there. There's a lot of paganism. 
so much that permeates our country. But where, where can it start? What, what can, the, the main issue, though, is, is what's God going to do in your heart? What's God, God going to do in your home? What's God going to do in our church? What's God, God going to do in our community? God is still working. He still wants to work. As long as he has us here, God's working, wants to work in the hearts of his people and reaching others. We need to be right with him to do the work he wants us to do. And I would encourage you to, if there's something that God convicts your heart about regarding um, now, anything in your life that might involve some things you have in your home, things you do in your home. You know, some of you might not be on the same page as far as in that, in that level of conviction with your spouse or with your children. And you might have allowed your home, and I especially speak to husbands and fathers here, you might have allowed certain things in your home that you might then be convicted about, you know, we really should do this differently. Don't uh, go in like a bowl in a china closet and just say we're cleaning house in our home and, and turn your family's lives upside down because they might not have experienced the same thing you've experienced. And so it, it takes wisdom and patience and being, and being a godly leader in your home that God wants you to be to then lead your family as to what is right and what is good. And especially the older the children get. They might have certain things they've been allowed to do and allowed to have. And one of the worst things that can be done, and this is just all of a sudden, well, I've allowed you to have this, now I'm just ripping everything away from you. No, and these things need to start in the heart, come from the heart. And, uh, and explain then, teach, instruct from God's word and say, here's what's, here's what's right, here's what's not right, and lead your family in that. And take them on the journey, take them on board in the living for God. And then for husbands and wives, maybe you don't have children, but you, you, you just need to, some of you might not be on the same page, maybe, maybe your wife or maybe your husband is not, uh, not living for God, does not have as much of a heart and a zeal for getting right with God and receiving the preaching of God's word. It's important to use wisdom in, in how to approach those things and not just run roughshod or be careless, but to properly tr still try to foster a good relationship, but yet still be able to do what you know God wants you to do in your own heart and in your own life. Now, what would be the greatest is if we have whole homes, whole families that are wholly dedicated to living for God. That's really what God's intention is, but I know in various situations that's not the case. And so it's what we need to just continue seeking the Lord for those people, seeking the Lord for that husband or that wife or those children, or whoever it might be, and asking God to do a work. But you can still be the influence and be a humble testimony in your own home and a humble, for, for husbands and fathers, be that leader for, for mothers, for wives, uh, leading your children and, and being that testimony to your husband. That can still be done. Just let God have his way as we get into this uh, week of meetings starting next Sunday. And uh, like I said, I don't know what's going to be preached. But um, it's important to have our hearts prepared for whatever it is. And I'm just confident that God's going to give him whatever needs to be preached. And it was, that was the case last year. And I'm just asking God for the same thing again this year. That whatever it is will be exactly what is needed for our church in this time. And I hope you'll pray that with me. Let's have a heart for revival.